Yeah, so I'm heading the group here in Vienna on virtual and augmented reality. I have a team of eight people here in Vienna and we are doing VR since, actually since 1995 and I started in 99. And um, over the years we worked with a lot of different hardware of course and a lot of different setups. And we're very happy to see that it's finally taking off and um, that there is some movement going on. So just to present uh, my group here briefly, because the work that I'm showing you is not my work, not only my work, but many other people worked on it. Um, what I'm showing you today is a large-scale virtual environment where we really walk through very large spaces. And this work was mainly done by Jana and by Christina and uh, Georg and Nanette are also working in this area. The others helped as well. And um, to give you an idea what this is all about, I would like to start with a brief motivation. So, did you ever want to walk through the pyramids, maybe inside? Or did you want to walk through the Guggenheim Museum in New York? Or explore the magnificent art of the um, Eremitage in St. Petersburg, or have a quick look at the Sistine Chapel in Rome, and maybe all of that in one day, you might say, visiting all these places in one day isn't really possible. Well, in reality it's not possible, but in virtual reality we can simulate these places and we can walk through large virtual spaces in a short amount of time. But why do we really want to walk through virtual environments? What is the special thing about walking? Isn't it so much more comfortable to sit at home in front of the TV or just have my headset on and, and look around? Well, there is a fundamental difference uh, to walking. When you're walking, first of all, it increases your sense of presence. You're more present in these environments. In addition, it enhances the perception of sizes and distances. When you're walking, you're kind of measuring the size, the distance of an environment, and you're getting a better feeling of space in general. For example, car manufacturers have the problem when they want to show new cars on the projection screen, it never looks right, it never feels right, and people don't estimate the size of the car correctly. And there are studies about that and its effect. People can't judge the size of a car correctly if you project it. But if you have it in a in a space where you can walk around, uh, it's much better and, and you can really have an idea how big is this car, how would I fit in into this Ferrari, and um, it, it enhances the sense of presence. It also focuses attention. Um, if you have a specific task, you're more focused if you can walk around and focus your specific view on some things. And it improves task performance. If you have to do specific things, you can do them better and, and faster in a, an environment where you can walk. But the problem is, um, if you uh, want to walk through a large environment, you need space. And uh, you need a platform which enables <laughs> you to walk. And that's why we built the Immersive Deck. We were funded by a German company who allowed us to do this development and I would like to show you a brief video. So in this environment, we have a person walking around freely. And uh, what we are using is a full body motion suit. We're using an Oculus head mounted display, camera on top. All the rendering is done on the person in the backpack or with a laptop, very powerful laptop. And so that person is fully tracked. And for tracking, we are using a very old, but also very low-cost technology. We have markers all over the ceiling, which has the advantage that we can cover basically inf an infinite amount of space at basically no cost. And we can also combine multiple rooms by just at attaching additional markers on the ceiling. And uh, what you see here is a room on the Wienerberg. We don't have it anymore, but at the time we, it was quite nice, 600 square meters. And you can walk around freely. And you can see the person exploring the space. She's walking through a living room here, looking around, getting a feeling of that space. And she's tracked precisely all the time with a camera with a 190 degree uh, field of view 
So even if you lie down, if you kneel, if you crouch, the camera always sees some markers on the ceiling and tracking works robustly. Here we have another scene at the lake. Person is walking from one room to the next and tracking is maintained. We have an elevator platform where you can change floors. You step on the elevator, you feel some rumbling. This is called the butt kicker, which causes the vibrations. And you can go from one floor to the next, and you think that you are moving up and down in different floors in this virtual environment. And now we can have people moving in different floors. So she can be in one floor, another person can be in another floor. But in reality, of course, they are all in the same room. That's one thing, how to use this space. But we can also share the space and share the experience so that people can see each other. Um, they all have avatar <coughs> representations due to the motion suit. They can see each other, um, touch each other, talk to each other, of course. And we can integrate real objects. We can integrate real walls, of course. We can integrate other objects that have different virtual representations. We can integrate the chair and the table, like in this example. This chair is also present in the virtual environment, so you're sitting on a virtual chair, and at the same time you're sitting at the real chair. You can move the chair, and it also moves in the virtual environment, and the same with the table. So that's the basic platform that we, are, we have developed, and we are still developing, we are still working on it. And the features of this platform is that it supports multiple users, it is low cost for a very large area. It, we have a virtual elevator. We have some kind of haptic interaction with smaller and a bit larger objects. And we have two ways of using this space for multiple users. One way is direct collaboration. You see your colleagues, you see the others in this space. And the other way is that people are on different levels, different floors, or in different scenes, and they are not sharing the space. And this gets very interesting, because there are a number of questions. How can we make sure that they are not colliding, for instance? Do they notice each other if they are close to each other? And that's why we did a brief study investigating if users actually notice each other. We assume that they cannot see each other. They are in different rooms, for example. They are in different levels in this virtual environment, but they are close to each other. Now the question is, do they feel each other's presence? They cannot see, they have a head-mounted display on, and they cannot hear. We gave them headsets with about 60 decibel white noise, so they couldn't hear anything and they couldn't see each other. Only possibilities were that they could maybe feel some airflow, some heat, floor vibrations, or some or smelling. And when people are walking, this is a... Sorry, I turned off my sound. It doesn't contribute to anything here. So this is a typical scenario where we have two people walking. And this is from our user study. They're walking close to each other. And they were instructed to point at each other if they notice each other. And as you can see, this is typical scenario here, nobody noticed anything and they just walked next to each other. And we had this study with 36 participants and we had nine pairs of users that were informed, they were told there is a colleague, he's walking close to you, point at him when you feel something and there were nine other pairs of users who were not informed, they were just told if you notice anything strange then point into this direction. And uh, we had different t tasks to do. Uh, they were walking, one user walking this direction at the same time, the other walking in the other direction. Then we had the task where they were walking next to each other very closely, getting closer, getting apart from each other. And then we had this task where they were walking along a corridor. Each user had his own corridor and was walking in the middle of his own corridor, a yellow one and a blue one. And the interesting thing was that uh, users basically didn't notice much. So from the uninformed group, from all the 36 uh, task walk walkthroughs, only two times someone noticed something. And from the 
informed groups, group where the users were told there is someone, <coughs> a few of them, about one third, noticed something. We can see an example here. Because sometimes we had users who were touching each other but didn't realize that there was another one. They were so distracted by the visuals that they completely ignored what was going on around them. And those who noticed each other, these were always the same people. <laughs> They are basically touching each other, and that's why they notice, otherwise they wouldn't. So, to sum it up, um, average distance, head-to-head -head distance was 1.6 meters, so the shoulders were very close most of the time. And the users were very, very impressed by the virtual reality experience. It was highly immersive. and. It was, there were always the same users who noticed the test partners, so just a few people basically who, who noticed and felt something. And most of the time they noticed floor vibrations and, and the steps of, of the colleague. Only one third of the, yeah, one third of the collisions was not noticed at all, so when they collided and touched each other, one third wasn't even remembered. And most of the people could not reconstruct the path that they walked. They were so immersed and also disoriented that they couldn't tell exactly where they were walking. And um, as I told you before, without any <coughs> a priori knowledge, users didn't notice each other. With a priori knowledge, only one third of the users noticed, noticed each other. What, this, what did this tell us? Well. We were thinking, in the beginning, we were thinking we would need some kind of larger um, safety zone around users. If we have multiple users walking in this environment, we must reserve some larger space around them so that they don't collide, that they don't notice each other. Now we know that we can basically ignore any safety zone because they are not going to notice each other, if, even if they are getting very close. We only have to warn them if there are direct collisions. We are doing a test now, which is looking into direct collisions. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as I told you, when you really want to walk through a large uh, environment, you usually need very large space. You saw the big room that we had. But are there any techniques, any possibilities how we can make users believe that they are walking in much larger spaces, but actually we just have a smaller restri restricted environment? And the techniques that are used there are called redirected walking. Redirected walking was first published in 2004, and there were a number of techniques published. Um, I want to show you a quick example here to give you an idea what this is all about. So here in this scenario, I think it is from 2003 or 2004, uh, we have users who are instructed uh, there is a fire alarm, and they have to walk from one from the first spot um, to press the button to turn off the fire alarm, then to the next, to the next, and to the next. And they are doing this task in the virtual environment. They have to push a button and, and then go on. Window closes, go on to the next button, and, and follow this path. But in reality, they are not walking uh, the whole distance. The lap is much smaller. This is the real lap where they are walking. And every time when they are rotating, when they are turning around, they are rotating much larger in the real environment. So in reality, they turn around 180 degrees, but in the virtual environment, they just turn around by 90 degrees. And you can trick people by showing them different visuals that they are moving much more in a virtual environment. And you can do this, this kind of gains. You can do this with rotation, as I showed you. You can also change the translation. For example, when someone is making a step, you make a much larger step in the virtual environment or a much smaller step. And there are certain thresholds. For example, you can increase and reduce step length by a factor of 1.2 and nobody notices. And there are similar thresholds for curvature and for rotation. And you can distract people this way and, and redirect them in different uh, ways. There is another study which uses change blindness, which is in effect 
that if you're focused on a specific task, for example, here the users have to walk into an office, turn on the computer, walk back out. They're focused on the computer here, they're walking into this office by this door to the task, and when they turn around and walk out, the door is suddenly on the other side and nobody notices. <laughs> so uh, you can also change the layout of the environment by just flipping the side of the doors. And we developed another um, form of redirection. We call it flexible spaces. And this is how it works. So we have a user here, user here on the top. He's in a nine by nine meter room and he's exploring a virtual environment. You see he's here in a smaller room. This is the top view of the environment. The user is moving in this room and he has a task. He has to remember all the tokens that he's seeing in the rooms and he has to explore this environment. And so he starts walking around and he's exploring this room walking around and then he takes the first door out and the corridor is generated and he's walking along this corridor and this is not not the fixed corridor it's not predefined there is no fixed virtual environment it's dynamically generated there is an algorithm generating this corridor now he's walking along the corridor and walking into a second room and as you can see the second room is overlapping the first room but because the person is walking around at least two corners he loses some kind of orientation and he doesn't realize that he's walking in circles. And if you ask him afterwards um, to draw the environment and how large it is, he thinks he's walking in a much larger environment. Here again, he's leaving the room, walking out through the corridor into another room. And again, this other room is overlapping a little bit with the first room. And so you can place multiple rooms, basically an infinite set of rooms, into a rather restricted environment. And of course the question is, why does this work? And this is also what we are looking at now. What are the specific requirements for these corridors? How is this working? Why is it working? Psychologists have never looked at that and this is a new phenomenon. And um, it's interesting to study why this is actually working and how can we design environments that fit in much smaller spaces. So what we have here, the properties of this environment, is that real worlds do not apply anymore. We have real walking, you can really explore an environment, and you have natural constraints, but it only works if you focus on, on some content. Uh, we do not have a map here. Uh, we cannot draw a map of this environment, but we have a connection graph. The rooms are always connected in the same way. The blue, the blue door leads to the blue room, the red door leads to the red room. There is a fixed connection of the rooms, but we cannot draw a map anymore. And we generate the connection between these rooms procedurally. The, the advantage is, of, uh, if we would keep the corridors fixed, people would remember over time. If they, they are walking the same corridor again and again, they would remember the way and would kind of get confused that there must be something wrong. But if you generate the corridors each time differently, then they have no chance of remembering. But I'm coming back to this a little bit later. Um, so we did a quick study only about this concept and, and used this color scheme, blue door to blue room, yellow door to yellow room, and asked the persons to focus on the content and the technique tends to be unnoticed by most users. There is successful navigation and search performance. People can search and find things in this environment, and they might even perceive it as possible. But even if people do not perceive it as possible, and do not think this is a real environment, they still accept it because it's consistent. It's always, you can walk, everything works in this environment, and you are just in a different virtual environment and accept the rules of this environment. You focus on content in this case. For example, applications would be uh, virtual museums. You can place a lot of art objects in different virtual rooms. You can explore this exhibition. You can explore these rooms and you focus on the content. You're not so much interested how these rooms are connected. You just go from um, one section to the next sec section of the exhibition. We can also do this outdoors, of course. Instead of using these corridors, it's a very rough and simple uh, visualization that you have seen here. 
you could have hedges uh, that restrict your path this or, or uh, stone pavement uh, that restricts you in some way and we could trick users by moving the sun for instance and um, I already said that there is no connection graph but uh, there is no map but a connection graph and, we, and this is not an architectural space it cannot be built we call it non-architectural so what are possible applications of this but also of the large scale VR that I showed before first and foremost of course there is entertainment gaming there is training all of these large scale VR environments are excellent for training not only military training also industrial training uh, where you have big industrial power plants uh, and people must learn how to operate them um, this can be used for virtual museums as I said um, virtual tourism um, you visit places that you've never been to before or you walk around there you explore rehabilitation is one such thing people nowadays are walking on treadmills half an hour one hour uh, after an accident to regain um, normal walking pattern to regain strength in the muscles and uh, you could do this much more entertaining and, and um, you could even log their movements and, and protocol how they are doing and um, yeah for all kind of exploration of fictional environments you can also use this of course but why do we always try to mirror reality uh, what we're doing most of the time what is happening now in virtual reality is that we are recreating real environments in the virtual world but we have here a new set of rules we have a new um, environment we can actually create non-architectural and truly virtual environments we can explore new rules we can change gravity we can change the way how people have to move so the rules can be changed this is something new here this is a new medium and this can be explored the virtual environment only needs to gain users acceptance and trust to believe in it and to believe, believe that you can do something in this environment and that it's consistent thank you uh, thank you for the talk I would just be really interesting to, to see what you think uh, could be possible to shrink down the room to make it possible to redirect people. So what is the, the minimum size you think you need to, to do something without letting people know they're walking in circles, basically? There is a study, for instance, I always tell this when people ask, um, there is a study that shows if you have, a, if you have people walking in a circle with 21 meter radius, they think they're walking straight. So if we had a room about 42 meters wide, we could make them walk infinitely and nobody would notice. But that's not very realistic. We don't have these rooms. Uh, we are always talking about room size 10 by 10, at least, to, to make something work. But these limits have to be explored. We're just at the beginning. So if you really want to walk bigger, you need some certain space it's not something for the living room in front of the tv it's <coughs> not enough space usually this is what what i'm presenting here is is technology that's not for the living room not for home we're rather thinking of gaming centers of some install installed spaces where people go and explore or do industrial training specific centers that have this equipment and have this infrastructure. Uh, are, are there some other factors influencing this tricking process like age, sex, size of people or any other things that makes it different or makes whatever you need to generate in order to trick someone different in one case than the other? And do you need to do it dynamically or you can pre-design everything aesthetically? The, um, the interesting question that is related to this is when do people actually get sick? Do they get cyber sick at some time if we trip them too much? That's a good question and we don't know yet. So um, there might be limits, yes. If you're tricking them too much that they are losing orientation constantly, yeah. But as you know, some people are more prone uh, to cyber sickness, others are not reacting so intensely. and yeah we don't know yet but yeah is, does that answer your question or is it only part of your yeah. question okay um 
how robust are the tricks against user manipulation, or how robust is the virtual system, in, in the sense that, for instance, a user might try to step through a wall that is just virtual, or the whole turning around and, and tricking the angles, um, how robust is that in regard to somebody trying to, to work against the virtual system? Yeah, first, to about your second comment, um, you have tracking and you always know where they are, so you can react. You know what they're doing and you can react to that. But to, to your first part, um, walking through walls, one of my students has a great idea for this. She wants to do a training first where we have real walls and if they try walking through it, they will bump into it. <laughs> so, it depends on your setup. Um, you could have some mock-up walls for the beginning where people can really touch and feel a little bit for the rest of the environment. You have an open installation and people would believe what they see. I, I have a question regarding the first experiment, basically. You show, I'm here. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, where you were ha having the markers all over the place and people walking around the cameras. Have you, what kind of equipment do you need? Because I think you mentioned you need a full body motion. Am I right? Yes. Why? Because we want to have the avatars, uh, we want to have avatar representations of people. Ah. So we want so to be able to see each other, that okay. they can wave to each other and <laughs> touch each other and have a realistic representation. But it's, it's not clear yet if we really need the full motion suit or if some sensors on some limbs would be sufficient to get this experience. For some things you would want to have detailed uh, tracking of all limbs and for others it's sufficient if you just know where the legs and the arms are. That was just the first, first part. The second part of the question is, <laughs> sorry, uh, what, what the, have you tried to do it with the mobile devices, like Gear VR, stuff like that, or does it only work with laptops? Do you need the whole laptop, or can it work with them, for example? There are two problems with mobile. Mobile is definitely the future. So in five, ten years, we are, we'll only be talking about mobile. But right now, first problem is we don't have the interfaces. We cannot plug in the motions here to the phone. And there is no way to access the motion suit, there is no software support and, and nothing. The second problem is performance. We just simply don't have the rendering performance and the computing performance of the phone that we need for tracking. We have so many devices, we have the tracking, we have the rendering of course, we have the motion suit, uh, we have a lip sensor as well sometimes. Um, so different combination of things and we don't have the performance. Um, I'm interested in the uh, in the experiment where you put the chair and the table and other real life uh, experiences in the virtual reality. So can you elaborate a little bit on the experience that people have? What is the actual? I mean, does it have to be the, the let's say if it's wood on the virtual reality, should it then be also wood or would be paper be fine? Or I mean, just so tell us a little bit more about yeah. this uh, real life versus virtual reality yeah. interface. Uh, yeah, paper, thing here. paper would be completely fine because the visual sense is so much stronger than the haptic sense, so you can override other senses with the visual sense. And um, we would like to do experiments now when you're touching a, a box, for example, you could make people believe that they are touching different objects. And just because they see them visually, they would believe it. So um, it's not such a big problem if you change the surface. Okay, but that's what? you're tricking me. <laughs> like you did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. One more. One last one. <laughs> Uh, how important is a photorealistic environment like in, in virtual reality? Is it important or is it does, does it For me it's not important, but the users nowadays have high and high expectations and it becomes more and more important because of the expectations of the user. But they would also believe simpler environments, but they, yeah. So because of the high expectations we need more and more rendering performance and deliver better and better. Um, much more important is very good uh, tracking. If you have very fast and precise tracking, it gives you such a smooth experience that delivers much more than a high fidelity uh, scene. But of course, nowadays you need it all. And best 8K resolution, full field of view, whatever, people want it all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Hannes. It's great.